Hello again, everybody, children of the Father's house. This is Philip Shields, your brother in Christ, with a part two of my last sermon. I was going to move on to other topics, but I really felt last time I asked you, I really felt I needed to do this again and go into it in even more depth. Last time I asked you if you've ever prayed for your city, your country, or even for all the nations to have a true awakening to repent and come back to God or come to God in the first place. I want to discuss it in even more depth today because it seems to be a topic, a new topic for a lot of people. I, I got a lot of positive agreement, but some are not so agreeable to it. And uh, so please, whatever side you're on, I think it's such an important topic, as you shall, as you shall see, a uh, very, very important topic. It's not a sermon about decrying how evil the country is. It's not a sermon about condemning the world. It's not a sermon about... Uh, thy kingdom come to get rid of all this mess we're in. Yeah, all that's important too. We have to cry aloud, show my people their sins. But this is a sermon about praying that the nations, that our country, that our city, that our people, that ourselves will come to repentance fully, fully and strongly before the coming of the Yeshua, of Jesus the Christ. I'd given the sermon on Nineveh and how Jonah had just given them the warning message, but apparently didn't really expect them to repent. He, he, he was kind of upset that they did, but they did. And Yahweh relented from wiping them off the face of the earth as punishment for their serious sins. So if you haven't heard that sermon, are you a Jonah or a Matthew, I hope you really will, because there's a lot to it. So that got me thinking, why can't that happen again? Why does Nineveh have to be considered a one-off? I gave a lot of scriptures that reasons and reasons in the last sermon to show that if Yahweh reserves Yahweh himself says he reserves the right to change what he says he's about to do if, that's if, the people will repent. We'll read that verse again and many others like it. I also showed you how so many of those who went before us prayed their heart out for their country. Nehemiah's prayer, this powerful prayer, I think it's Nehemiah 9. He prayed that the people would repent and be forgiven, that our Father would be merciful. Nehemiah 1 Daniel 9, so many, many prayers in the Bible. Romans 9, Romans 10, where Paul prayed for his countrymen. You remember the examples I gave you of Samuel saying it would be a sin to quit praying. Moses and Aaron, Daniel, like I said, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, many times. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Micah have examples of intercessory prayer for their nation, for the world even. Esther, thank God for yes for Esther who organized a three-day fast from her uh, whole court staff to pray for their country. Would we be here today if it wasn't for Esther? Deborah prayed and prayed for the country and praised as well as prayed. In Jehoshaphat's day, men, women, and children all gathered together to pray and to fast, as you can read in 2 Chronicles 20. So whether you're a man or a woman, if you're a child who believes, I hope you'll hear this sermon and take it to heart. The future of your family, your church, your city, your country depends upon us praying. And I'll prove it. I'll absolutely prove it. And if you believe it's too late or that the world and our country is too evil to repent and for God's pronouncements to be changed by Him, then isn't that being a Jonah? Isn't that saying something's impossible for our Creator? Isn't that saying that though He states over and over and over that He has no desire or takes any pleasure in the death of the wicked, that he can't cause us to come to repentance? I know God tells us over and over, please repent, I want to forgive you. Why would he say that if it was a done deal? The other way, I mean, if it was a done deal, that there was going to be no repentance, no possibility of it. I don't believe Abba is into playing games. I don't believe he's into saying words just to make himself look good. He says things because they're possible. And I know some of the things, and all things are possible with him. And I know some of the things I preached are a bit foreign to some of the people, especially in the Church of God groups. But please give it careful thought as you wade through it with me again today. Now, some have answered that they also wish our nations would repent. I, I just ask, so if, if you do agree with me, uh, have you gone beyond wishing since that last sermon to actually praying for the country to repent? Have you considered looking at the calendar and finding a day to fast? As Joel 2 says, as we'll say again today, when, and will you pray for the nation and for your church and for your own repentance and do it today, tomorrow? Start with yourself. 
Others have concluded it's too late because they give lots of reasons. The country's not going to repent. They have all their reasons. Here are some of the reasons they give. First of all, I think it's based on our understanding that only a few are being called right now, and uh, each one in their own time sequence, and that's led to the false conclusion, I believe, that therefore it's pointless to pray for anyone else. You know, people have told me, if Father's not working with them, then why pray for them? It's not going to go anywhere. If he's not working with them, there's no chance of them uh, knowing that there's a God in heaven and repenting. Of course, I'd say go tell Paul that then, Romans 10. Paul apparently had no idea about that. Romans 10, verses 1 and 2, he says, My heart's desire, and my daily desire, my heart's desire, my fervent wish, is that my people Israel would repent. He, chapter 9, I think it is, he says he'd give up his own, his very own salvation, if that's what it would take to bring his nation to repentance. And how do you know, and how do I know which people, which nation, which city, for that matter, will be the ones Yahweh is going to do mighty things through, if we would just believe and pray for them? I believe Father is working with his children long before they or others will see it. So let's not think, even if that reasoning were correct, that since Abba may not be calling them now, you don't know who he's calling. You don't know how your prayers will affect somebody. Wouldn't that be neat? Wouldn't that be really cool? My, my wife was telling me the other night, wouldn't that be really cool if in the resurrection, in the millennium, if sometime in the future, an angel is able to tell us, this person is in this place right now of being in relationship to Yahweh because you prayed for them. Another reason people have is some people think and believe that we're commanded not to pray for the world. There certainly are several verses in Jeremiah that seem to say that. Certainly even Christ in John 17, 9 says, I don't pray for them, I for the world, I pray for them, I pray for the disciples. And at that moment in time, he was doing that. And But he also was sending them into the world. And you read that in verses 17 and 18 of John 17, his prayer at the, at the Last Supper, uh, at the Passover meal there. Later, to make disciples of all nations. And Paul prayed for his country, as I've said. So many clear scriptures where so many did intervene and prayed for the carnal people of their time. Moses and Aaron ran into the very midst of the plague, if you remember that story from the last sermon. And Yah was moved by their love and their heart and the depth of compassion those two men had, that they would stand between the living and the dying and say, Father in heaven, God Almighty Yahweh, stop, please stop, please have mercy on your people. Another reason people give is they do, there do seem to be some very clear verses that some imply that once Yahweh's declared something, his word's going to be accomplished. So we ask, what's the point? Well, we'll explore that some more. He always puts a caveat on that, though, that if I, but if that nation repents, we're going to read that shortly. And perhaps another reason uh, some don't pray for national repentance and forgiveness. So I think a lot of us, whether we realize it or not, have a them versus us mentality. We're not part of them or their world, and they're not part of us. We're part of heaven's world. It can be very elitist, very exclusivist, though, and in the end come back to bite us. Some have come so far out of the world that they've developed a very condemning attitude to people, to sinners in the world. Our Father sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I read that someplace in there, didn't you? I'll definitely address that. And I think a major reason we also don't pray for the nation is, are you ready for this? Too many of us are modern-day Jonas. We are Jonas, Jonas. We just want to preach the Ezekiel warning message. To cry aloud, show my people their sins. Lift your voice like a trumpet and all the verses that we can say so well. And to announce like Jonah that in a short time, doom and calamity is coming. But we miss the last part of the message that if people would turn around and seek the living God, He is an amazing Father with a heart like no other. Hear my sermon on Are You a Jonah or Matthew? So sometimes it's because we are Jonas that we don't preach and we don't preach this message or we don't believe the message that I'm preaching today. I have this very, very, very strongly in my heart. My own 
personal choice was to go and do other sermons. And this thought just kept coming to my heart. Hey, that this one needs another. It's kind of like bombing the uh, bombing a, an enemy bunker or whatever that that's in, embedded deep down in the in the in the mountains or in the tunnels or whatever. You might have to hit it again and again. And uh, maybe maybe God's spirit was just telling me hit it again. My heart's full of this subject, which came suddenly on me a couple months ago. I think for many Church of God folks and some Hebrew roots and Messianic folks. This can be a most important sermon for your future and for the future of the world. I'll be turning to Jeremiah 18 again. Jeremiah 18. I'll be the first to say the likelihood of any real repentance happening on a massive scale is almost nil when you just look at the, the, the evidence around you. I know that. But God is not a God limited by what we see, is he? Faith is the evidence of things not seen and the hope that we have. I see the wickedness piling on in every direction you look, like you do. In every way possible, we're becoming like evil Sodom of old, and Yahweh even calls our modern-day city Sodom. So likelihood of any real repentance is almost nil. But our God is a miracle-working God, and He loves to show us what He can do when we just believe. Nineveh, in my view, is not a one-off. It's not at all. Let's read again what he says in Jeremiah 18, verses 7 to 9. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Jeremiah 18, verse 7, 8 Verse 7 and 8 in particular, I think that's just incredible how plain that is. Jump now to verse 11. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Yahweh, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. Turn around, you guys. Don't keep going that way. Are you hearing Yahweh's heart? Are you hearing Yahweh's heart? And how do they respond to him when he says, I'm planning something really tough. It's going to hurt you guys for your own good. I've got to have you turn around. Please turn around before I have to start spanking. And Jeremiah 18, 12, you know, so many verses said, I sent my prophets rising early telling you these things, but you wouldn't listen. In Jeremiah 18, verse 12, and they said, this is hopeless. That's hopeless, so we'll go ahead and keep doing what we're doing. Well, they didn't get it. They thought it was hopeless. So nothing changed. And disaster did come upon them. These things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Are we going to heed and learn or not? You know, I've been reading at night through the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Obadiah and Nahum and Micah and some of these other books. Nothing's changed. They make it very clear that Yahweh, when you read through those chapters, it's really clear Yahweh is royally ticked off. He is really upset at not just Israel or Judah. He's upset at the whole world. He's upset at Edom. He's upset at Egypt. He's upset at Syria and Babylon and and on and on and on and on. And before, in the years before Yeshua lands on the Mount of Olives, there's going to be a shaking of this earth that's going to be so profoundly difficult. We better start thinking about it and start having the heart of Yahweh himself towards people. So don't give up on the possibility. It worked for Nineveh. It can happen again. And if it doesn't, I believe this kind of praying will be good for us, brethren, will be good for us. I read to you Ezekiel 9 last time, how God said to mark those, start at the altar and put a mark on the foreheads of those who cry and sign, spare them, but get the rest. It will be good for us to sigh and cry 
and to feel what's going on in the nations and not be part of what's going on in the nations. I did get an email from a dear brother who attends one of the Church of God groups here in the West, here in the United States, in the West, and he did get the message, and here's what he said. I hope he doesn't mind me reading it. I think what he said was so godlike I have to share it. And I appreciate, frankly, getting some feedback from some of you. I thank you for, you know, it's almost 1 o'clock in the morning. I work very hard at these, and I work very hard at trying to make a living as well. And sometimes it's real tough making a living and doing this. But but I do it because I feel something in my heart saying to do it. I thank you for the last message. I'm quoting an email from a friend whom I hadn't heard from for a couple of years. I thank you for your last message. I read most of it at 4 this morning and just finished it. It certainly hit home. Speaking for myself, I have to admit that I was very complacent about what was going to happen to our cities and our country. Sort of it's inevitable and going to happen regardless of whether I pray or not. I keep having to remind myself that if you pray for someone, you can't be angry with them, and so your mind truly benefits regardless whether they repent or not. You benefit whether they repent or not, he says. Thank you again, Philip. I will pass along your sermon. This man has Father's heart. He feels Father's heart. That's what I'm trying to get across to all of you. Feel Father's heart. Fall on your face on the carpet or floor that you have at home and beg, first of all, for your own repentance and mercy, then that he will be merciful to the body and lastly to the nation. And pray for your city, your country, that they'll repent, that Father will be merciful. And then, if, even if your prayer doesn't change the course of prophecy, and if the nation doesn't repent, it will still have changed you to have prayed that prayer. Last night I was speaking, or a few nights ago I was speaking with a kindly widow from back east, back in one of the northeastern states, who said something close to this. She says, I wasn't taught this before where I had been attending. We just believed. I, I don't have a church, by the way. I'm just sending these out to people who want to hear it. You can go to the website. You, you keep attending where you're going, all of you. We just believed only a few are being called now. The rest are doomed to punishment. And there was no point in praying for them. You have really opened my eyes. Thank you. Now, if the world doesn't repent, it does say in John 3 that the world, God sent light into the world, but the world did not come to the light, for they love their own darkness, their own evil. Their, and the evil people don't like to come to the light, lest their evil be exposed. And if they don't come to acknowledge Him, that they're, they will be punished. They will be. I believe that what will happen to millions and millions of people around the world will largely depend on what you, the elect children of Yahweh, do or don't do. How we pray or don't pray. How we care or don't care. Remember, but for the elect's sake, no flesh would be saved alive. Do you remember that? Praying for our Father's mercy with the world, if you have a heart, and it's from your heart, will be a good thing in his eyes. He's going to honor those who have that prayer. Turn now with me to Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. I wept as I read my father saying this about us today. The context in Ezekiel 22, if you start in verse 22, all the way to 29, is about Israel's spiritual leaders and how how they've not raised the bar in obedience. They break the Sabbath. They don't make any difference between the holy and the unholy, between the clean and the unclean, between what's kadosh and what's not kadosh, holy. There were gaps in the wall of the spiritual defense. And they were supposed to be the pastors and the guardians of the nation and of the people. And Yahweh says this, Ezekiel 22 and verse 30 31. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap, in that hole in the wall, who would stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. I want you to hear what Yahweh is saying. I looked for a man to stand in the hole, in the gap before me 
on behalf of the land, the country, that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Therefore, I poured out my indignation on them. I've consumed them with my fire of my wrath. I've recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says Adonai Yahweh. Brothers, sisters, are any of you ready to step up, stand in the gap, and defend the land? Speak in behalf of the land. Speak in behalf of the church, of our country, of our spiritual Israel, and the physical Israel. Anyone? Isaiah 59, verses 14 to 16. Isaiah 59, 14 to 16. After a long statement about how bad things are in the nation, Isaiah says this. Yahweh says this. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands afar off. Truth has fallen in the street. Equity cannot enter, so truth fails. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then Yahweh saw it, and it displeased him. He was offended that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, no one, and wondered how there could be no intercessor. Yahweh wonders how on earth can there be no intercessor. None. No one standing in the breach. No one interceding. Do we understand about the verses that the love of many shall wax cold? Shall I find faith on the earth? And all those other verses? And how the church is asleep? Or the church is lukewarm? An intercessor is one who prays for others. It's someone who fills the holes in the defensive wall. It's someone who cares enough to come alongside, be a paracletos. And I gave a sermon on that a while back. The ship that comes alongside you, be a paracletos. Yahweh is telling us, and he gave a ton of scriptures last time and more this time. God is looking for you to be an intercessor for the body of Christ as well as for the nation, for spiritual Israel, as well as for physical Israel. There's so many, like I said, who went before us. Why can't we be a Nehemiah, a Daniel, Esther, or Paul in our day? Why can't we be an Ezra? Why can't we be a Moses, a Samuel? What's with our generation that Yah says, that Yahweh says we aren't interceding for the land, for the nation of the world? People are people. The ones the prophets were praying for were just as carnal as the people living today. That hasn't changed. Yahweh says he's amazed. No one. Not a single one. From this moment on, will I, I want to be an intercessor in behalf of the land as long as I have breath. Will you join me? Will you join me? And lift your holy hands up to Yahweh, to, to, Abba, to Yahweh, and say, Father in heaven, Help me to intercede. Help me not to disappoint you. Will you read Daniel 9 four or five times on your knees and then pray something like that for the country? Would you read Nehemiah 1? Would you read Esther 4 and talk about where it talks about Esther saying, all of us are going to fast for three days and three nights and then I will go in and if I perish, I perish. But who knows? Maybe Yahweh will hear our prayer. Remember, we are to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem and give him no peace until he brings it. Remember those who bless Israel, we're told in Genesis 12, shall be blessed. Those who bless you shall be blessed. So yes, I say God bless America. Your heart and mind, your heart and my heart, listen carefully, brethren, must not be among those prophesied at the end times where it says, and the hearts of many shall wax cold. Let that not be said of you. Let that not be said of you. Be someone standing in the breach. Be someone praying for the land. Be someone with a heart that cares. Be one who will be marked by Yahweh as one who is sighing and crying for what he sees going on. 
You see, we've been trained to pray, Thy kingdom come, as our Master Himself taught us. But let's not translate that to mean hurry up and get here so we can get all this bad stuff over and done with. No, we want His kingdom to come. But we also want there to be a softening of the heart of the peoples and a repentance. Oh, King. Oh, yes, Yahweh. Oh, Yeshua, may your kingdom come. Yes, Master. But remember, all of us on this planet are but flesh. We're weak, Master. We're sinful. Oh, that's true. But please, Master, deal with the whole world with as much mercy as you can. Please, O oh, Yahweh, our Father, remember this. We who are of your household, who should know better, we have so much to repent of ourselves. We're splintered instead of being one body. We attack one another. We gossip. We divorce the spouse you gave us and then marry someone else. Too many of us are like the people in Babylon. Forgive the land, Father. Forgive the land, Creator. Start with us. Yahweh's looking for an intercessor, brethren. He found no one. How about committing yourself to become a prayer warrior for your people? How about committing yourself to attack the gates of hell with prayer? And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Don't tell me it's too late. You go back and read the whole book of Jonah if you have to, over and over again. Don't tell me it doesn't matter. Yahweh says if it weren't for us, no flesh would be saved alive. He says that the coming Elijah does not turn our hearts back to him. He's striking the earth with utter extinction, utter destruction. With a curse, it says. That means utter extinction in Malachi 4, 6. That's what Yahweh's saying. And we need to listen up. I'm not here to preach smooth things to anybody. And you're not here to listen to smooth things either. Another thing about being an intercessor, let's not be guilty of just praying and doing nothing. James warned against the be warm, be filled syndrome in James 2, verses 5 to 15 to 17. You know, when you hear that somebody, a brother, needs, needs some help, and you say, I'll pray for you, I'll put you on my prayer list, be warm, be filled, you're in my thoughts, and all that bunch of rubbish. If we don't do something about it, is what James is saying, your faith is dead. Find a way to pray and then do something to prove your prayer. The praying for someone, putting them on your prayer list isn't rubbish. Don't get me wrong. I didn't mean it that way. I meant if, that, if, that's, all you, if that's all you do, find a way to proactively help a problem be solved. For example, many of us say we're against abortion. How about being for life in some cases? How about doing something to support the clinics who help these abandoned young women who are doomed to a life of poverty, it seems like, who are pregnant and need help? How about putting our money where our mouth is and helping them financially? Down the road for me is a clinic with the pictures of about 1,200 babies whose lives they've rescued from certain abortion. Support those clinics. Back up those girls who messed up but want to do it right from now for their baby going forward. Support them. Don't condemn them. Come on, brethren. How many of us, if we're totally honest, when we were dating, maybe we didn't get our wife pregnant or something like that, but how many people hearing this, reading this around the world could say that every moment that they were dating would be something they could have everybody watch? Almighty God was watching. Let's not be condemning of them. Let's help them have that baby. Let's help them raise that baby and have funds to do it right. Thank Almighty El Shaddai that there are people standing in the gap for these scared pregnant teens and young women. Men, let's support them. We get them that conditioned and walk away. Shame on us. Shame on us. Shame on us, man. Do you get the difference? It's much easier to just condemn them for whatever sin you think they did and walk away. But really, is that what being a light's all about? Is that what Jesus said to, to, and did in John 8? Sure, he told her to sin no more. But he also said the very loving words the woman caught in the act of adultery. Where was the man? The Bible says man and woman should be stoned. 
she was caught in the very act. There had to be a man there. That's so unfair. And he knew that was unfair. When there were no more two witnesses, you could not condemn somebody unless there were two witnesses. After he'd written things on the ground and they walked away, he said the very loving words, neither do I condemn you. There's something about the sinless Son of God that allowed even terribly sinful women, like the woman at the well in John 4, to feel comfortable around him. Yeshua was able to use her to spread the gospel. That's an example of standing in the gap and fighting for those despondent young girls, in this case, and their babies, the least of these in the world. Don't be hard-hearted. Despise them. Those babies need, need a help, a helping hand. Don't despise them. Help them. Love them. Young girls who have no husband, no money, no hope, who fear the future, no wonder they ponder abortion. Let's do something for them. We have not been called to just sit back and wait for the time we can flee to a nice place of safety, to care less about the world. You won't be there. And I won't be there if that's our attitude. That's sure not the mindset of our Father and our Savior. In fact, I'd like you to think about this. Praying for your, when you pray for the nation and the city and the country, you're praying for future brothers and sisters. That'll be good for you. Did you hear that? You're praying for your future brothers and sisters. They don't know they're, they're, they're your future brothers or sisters, but they will be called in their time, each one in their own order. And uh, someday they will be brought into the plan of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 24, especially 1 Corinthians 15, 23, says each one in his own order. They will someday be brought to repentance, will be brought into the same family. So treat them like you would if you knew that they were actually your kin, your, your brothers and sisters, because they are. And uh, that's what our big brother did on the tree. He interceded for them. They know not what they do. Forgive them, Father. His mind in us will help us pray the same way. I think I mentioned last time, didn't I, or one of the other sermons, how I saw the words for kingdom of God, spelled kingdom of God, on a floral display, and I thought it was profound, because the kingdom of God is also the kingdom of God. So when you see the world as your future kin, you got to love them. It gets rid of that them versus them versus us. It gets rid of the we're better than they, the elitism. And it's uh, it's all of us versus Satan, brethren, who kidnapped the, our family and sold them into spiritual slavery. And we're going to get them back. We're going to get them back. Let's start fighting for them now. They're going to persecute us in the meantime. <laughs> but they won't know better, so we'll have to say the same prayer that our brother said on the on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't really know what they're doing. But that's okay. They're going to be kin. We're going to be resurrected. They'll be resurrected and we'll be fine. You understand what I'm saying? See the world as your kin. And uh, it gets rid of the them versus us. We're, hey, we're, we're in this together against Satan. He's the enemy. So Yahweh loves the world. Remember that too. Yahweh loves all the world, not just modern day Israel. I think sometime in the last sermon I may have given the impression to pray for especially America and Canada and Britain, Netherlands and so on. I want to say again, Yahweh loves all the people of the world. John 3.16, he died for everybody. That's why I'm expanding in this sermon to go beyond the church, beyond Israel, beyond Judah, beyond America and Australia and all that. As you know, many of you know, uh, I believe that uh, the lost ten tribes can be largely found in northwestern Europe and 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 uh, United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So I want to say again, Yahweh loves all the people of the world. John 3.16. Sometimes I feel I'm, when I'm among conservative Church of God brethren or evangelicals or Hebrew roots type of people that we've forgotten that. He doesn't just love the elect called out ones. He doesn't love just Israel or modern-day remnants of Israel, of the ten tribes. No, he says he loves everybody, so much so that he gave up his own son to sacrifice. He sacrificed his own son for us, so he could come into a covenant relationship with us. And all humanity is made in Yahweh's likeness. There's no white, black, or brown. There's no green, purple, or polka-dotted with him. It must be the same for us. His son died for the sins of a teenager in Peru, as much as he died for mine or yours. 
He died for the gays or straights in Tel Aviv, which I've been told has about the highest ratio of gays of any city in the world. Yes, he died for them also. And Yeshua died for those men and women too. My father sent his son to die for the Buddhists and for the Muslims and the pagans, the Hindus, as well as the billions who say they're a Christian but who, don't, who sure don't live by it. Why did I say all that? Because here's why I've been reading the prophets. Yahweh's ticked at the whole world. And the whole world's going to feel his wrath soon. But at the same time, he died for the whole world. He loves the whole world. Now, many of you are pro your church or pro America or pro Israel or anti just about everyone else. <laughs> We've got to get over that thinking. That's why I'm talking about this now. We've got to be thinking in terms of God loves everybody in the world. And he would love everyone to come to salvation in their time and his way. But he certainly would love to have to know that his children care enough to be praying for them. Do you remember when Yeshua got angry at the Jews for keeping Gentiles out of the temple worship? They could come on the temple on the temple uh, mount area, uh, but they could only go so far. There would be a wall there, and there were signs on the wall that basically said any Gentile going past this wall does so at peril of his own life. And Yeshua, when he saw the way the Gentiles who wanted to come worship were being treated, and they weren't allowed to go anywhere near the altar. Yeshua quoted Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7, where Yahweh calls on the Gentiles to come and worship before him and to bring their sacrifices to him on his altar. It was, after all, the Gentiles who helped build the temples. Remember the cedars of Lebanon, King Hiram, and the artisans from various countries? Remember it was Herod the Edomite, the Edomian, who built the temple Yeshua went to. Why am I saying all this? So I'm asking you to pray for the whole world, for people of the world, that God would be merciful to them, and God would call those who's calling now. And Yahweh has a deep, deep love for Gentiles, as he does Jews and Israelites. In fact, the Micah 4 says, All the nations, many nations, will come into Jerusalem to worship. Zechariah says, All the nations will come to keep the feast. So if you're reading this or hearing this in a foreign country, in China, in Peru, in Russia... Iran or Thailand. I love you Russians. You attended a worship service with a Russian congregation right here in Vancouver not long ago. About 150 people. They're all praising God in Russian and Hebrew. It was fantastic. If you're reading this or hearing this in Iran, in Thailand or the Philippines, wherever you are, in Africa, Yes, you are loved very, very much by your Maker, and He wants you to be praying for your own repentance and forgiveness first, and then for your church, and then for your nation and the world. And ask Him to bless Israel while you're at it. He will bless you for doing so. And I hope you will. So then go to my website, contact me if you're in a foreign country hearing this. I'd love to hear that Yahweh is spreading His message of calling all nations to you in your ears also. Now, Another reason we don't do this is because we have this really firm belief, some of you do in any way, that the real God over all the earth is Satan, you think. And I'm thinking, oh, no, 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 no. Satan's the God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The King James Bible says of the world, he's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The, he, the, the Greek word there means age of this time period. I think we get a little confused. Another reason we've distanced ourselves from the world. Satan is the prince of this world. That's true. He's the prince of this age. Ephesians 2.2 2 and John 12.31 and John 14.30 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, All that's true. He's the father of his children, those who follow his ways. John 8 and and uh, he's deceived everyone. The whole world's under his sway. He's called the God of this age. And, uh, but there can only be one true God, and it's Yahweh. Yeshua said, you, the one true God, Father. The Father, you're the one true God. John 17, verses 2 and 3. Isaiah 45, verse 21 says, besides me, there's no other God. But I want to make something clear. 
We've so long been told and taught that Satan is the god of this world that we can forget it should be translated age. It's temporary. He's a frustrated god wannabe. He still has to get permission from Yahweh, remember, before he can do what he wants. Remember the book of Job? It's still Yahweh who appoints the kings of the earth and not Satan. He's not really God of this world, but of this age. So I think we're more inclined to actively pray for our earth, our planet, and the people on it when we really understand who the true God over heaven and earth is. It's not Satan, though he wants you to think that he is. Now read for me, read with me Micah 4.13. Micah 4.13, Zechariah 4.14. Revelation 11:4, where it talks about Yahweh being God of the whole earth, meaning the globe, the land, the earth. Remember, Yahweh is looking for someone to intercede for the land. Yahweh is not just God of Israel. He's not just God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sure, they were the ones who first recognized him as God, as having God and being God and having Godship and Lordship over them. But he still is supreme over heavens and earth. In Genesis 24.3, Yahweh, the Elohim of heaven and the Elohim of the earth. Genesis 24.3, I've, I've just read that. Revelation 11.4, these are the two olive trees, the two witnesses, the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Okay? And Isaiah 54, verse 5, your maker is your husband, Yahweh of hosts is his name. He is called God of the whole earth. Isaiah 54, verse 5, God of the whole earth. That won't be seen in its total fruition until the world repents and he establishes his kingdom on earth and his ways are restored. But he is God over all the earth. And he's letting Satan right now be God of this age. But when you understand that he is God of all the earth, I think it changes our attitude about praying for the people of the earth. Someone once said to me, I'm going to change topics here a little bit. Another reason they say that we can't pray for the people of the world, because God says in Malachi 3, verse 6, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, and I do not change. I won't spend a lot of time on this except to say that there are simply too many examples, many of which I gave last time, and I will continue to do so in this sermon, where he did change his mind. If you read Malachi 3 in context, it begins with a discussion of his imminent return in verses 1 to 5, the return to earth. And then in verse 6, he says, For I am Yahweh, I, I am Yahweh, I do, I do not change. Many stop reading right there instead of reading the whole context. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. So he says, It's because I am who I am and I don't change that you're not wiped out. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. And now listen to Yahweh's plea in Malachi 3, verse 7, at the end of it. Return to me, and I will return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. But you said, in what shall we return? He's saying, come on, come back to me. Repent, return, repent. It's the same root meaning there. And I will return to you. He's actually using the fact that he is today what he was yesterday and will be tomorrow as proof that he can change his mind if we would return. What doesn't change is his nature, his forgiveness, his love. What changes not is his promise after promise after promise that if our people repent with all our heart, he will forgive us. So our confidence that that will happen is not based on our goodness, but on his mercy. It's based not on our merits, but on his merits. Because he is what he is. I am Yahweh, I don't change, therefore you're not consumed. Now, I'm going to ask you one more reason why I think that we need to be praying for the repentance of the world and the country and the nation and all that. I want to ask you this question. I'm changing gears again here. Before that great and dreadful day of Yahweh, there will be a figure who will come in the spirit of Elijah. He comes just before that dreadful day, according to Malachi 3, the first three verses in Malachi 4. 
verses 4 to 6. In fact, let's read that now. Malachi 4, verses 4 to 6. I do not believe that in, that the Elijah spoken of in Malachi 4, verses 4, 5, and 6 has already come. The context is that he will be like John the Baptist, who was preaching just before the, the coming of Yeshua, and whose ministry even overlapped with that of Yeshua. And so that's what when it, when it says he shall come suddenly to his temple. Uh, suddenly is not 20 or 30 years ago. Suddenly is overlapping. It's right now, right here. At least that's the way I believe it. I, I, I don't believe this Elijah has come yet. In Malachi 4, verses 4 to 6, Remember the law of Moses. Remember the Torah of Moses, my servant which I commanded him in Sinai and Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. So John the Baptist was a type of that, of it, but that wasn't the great and dreadful day. That wasn't the day of the Lord. That wasn't the day of Yahweh. That wasn't the final time. And this great Elijah who's coming will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now the word curse here in verse 6 is the Hebrew words kerem, me for meaning utter destruction. Utter destruction. If this Elijah to come is not successful in restoring our relationship with our father, and with our family relationships, and our obedience to his laws, Yahweh says it's all over. So when that man is revealed, we should be ready to heed and support this ministry of Elijah. So this end time Elijah's message, after he reveals the name of our Father and the true worship, is to repent, turn around, get back to heartfelt, obedient old relationship. If it's too late for the country or the world to repent, here's what I'm talking about Elijah right now. If it's too late for our country and the world to repent, why is the end time Elijah going to come preaching repentance and obedience? Surely our father isn't into playing games with our emotions if there's no chance of any real repentance. Why send a Jonah to Nineveh? Why send an Elijah to the end time people, if you see what I mean? Again, this Elijah was not a human being uh, that has come so far, except for John the Baptist, as a type of that. In Mark 9, verses 11 to 13, at, right after the, uh, uh, the vision, the transfiguration, they asked him, why do the scribes say then that Elijah must, must come first? And then he answered and told them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. So he is coming John the Baptist was beheaded already by this point. He was gone already. But how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it's written about him. So he said, yeah, John the Baptist was a type of that, but there is also Mark 9, verse 12, an Elijah who is going to come first and who will restore all things. John came just before and overlapped, and that's going to happen again. All right, so um, what was the original Elijah's message? Wasn't it repent, turn back to Yahweh, and forsake the worship of Baal? Baal means Lord. And on, on Mount Carmel, he actually says, ha Baal, which means the Lord, and start worshiping Yahweh. And look at the Mar John the Baptist's uh, message. In Mark 1, verses 4 and 5, uh, the Elijah in Yeshua's day was John the Baptist. What was his message? It was repent. The coming Elijah's message is going to be repent. If there's no point in repentance, if it's not possible for the world to repent, why will there be a coming Elijah preaching Repentance. Mark 1, verses 4 to 5, John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And all the land of Judah and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were baptized by him, confessing their sins. That's going to happen 
again. And what's the threefold message of the final Elijah yet to come? It's to repent, obey the laws of Yahweh, and turn your hearts back to your loved ones, to your fathers, and the ch- fathers to their children, and to God himself as Father. And I think part of it, too, is his very name. Elijah is Eli- Eliyah. Eliyah in the Hebrew, Eliyah. Eli means my God. And then Yah, my God, Eli, is Yah. Maybe you have an L, E, means my God is Yah. That was the prophet's very name. My God is Yah. And he restored the name of the true God to Yahweh from Baal, which could be translated Lord. Elijah basically said on Mount Carmel, if you translate it into English, I want you to remi- I want to remind you that I gave a couple sermons on what is the Creator's name. If you haven't heard those, I really, really urge you to hear those. Today, First Kings 18 verses 20 to 21, the end time Elijah is going to do the same thing. First Kings 18:20 20 to 21. Today, let's decide if we should worship the Lord. That's what Habaal means in the Hebrew. Ha means the. Okay. Habaal, a Habaal. He says, today we're going to determine if we should continue to worship Habaal, the Lord, or Yahweh. And actually, he begins by saying, if we're going to worship Yahweh or Habaal. But in our Bibles, when Elijah asked the people in King in 1 Kings 18.21, even in our Bibles, our translations really mess it up. And our English says, if, it, if the Lord is God, meaning, meaning Yahweh, and they say the Lord here is God, but if Baal, follow him. Uh, and, and, and you all say Baal, but it's Baal, okay? And, and brethren, that's not what the... It's not right. Baal means the Lord. How Baal means the Lord. But Yahweh is the name here. He's, what he's saying is if, 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 if Yahweh is Elohim, follow him. But if Habaal, the Lord, is God, then follow him. Anyway, the translators changed the name of the true God to the Lord instead of keeping it Yahweh, while they kept the pagan idol Baal's name intact. He actually said, if Yahweh is Elohim, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. But if the Lord, follow him. And then in 1 Corinthians 18, 21, So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together in Mount Carmel. How long will you falter between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Abaal, if the Lord is, then follow him. The people answered him not a word. And then when it came time for him to pray, in verse 36 to 37, at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah, uh, the prophet, came near and said, Yahweh. That was his name, you see. Yahweh is his name. Elohim is what he is. El Shaddai and those things are titles. His name is Yahweh, and I made that very clear, very plain in the two sermons I gave on that. Anyway, um, Yahweh, uh, Elijah the prophet, Eliyah, came near. Eliyah means, my God is Yahweh, remember? Eliyahu. The prophet came near and said, Yahweh, Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Abram, Yitzhak, and Israel, okay? Let it be known this day that you are Elohim. You are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that you are Yahweh Elohim, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. You turn their hearts back to you again. What was the Elijah to do? He was to turn the hearts back to the fathers and the father's heart back to to them. And I'm sure that Elijah was praying to him, please have mercy, turn your heart back to your people. And as father did that, he in turn turned the people's heart back to him. That's the first father that has to be determined here. And then once he's in place, then we turn our hearts back to the fathers that came before us, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice he says, Father, he says, Yahweh Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Those are also the fathers that we turn our hearts back to. And then also in a more localized way, right here in our very families, we turn our hearts back to one another. The families have been hit hard by Hasatan, by the Satan, by the adversary. 
Notice the turning of the hearts is back to the fathers, back to Yahweh himself first. He started by getting Israel to quit worshiping Habaal, the Lord, and start worshiping him by his true name, Yahweh. He is the father we start with, and his name is Yahweh. His name is Yahweh. 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 That's his name. Yahweh. The short firm is Yah. We say hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise. Yah. Praise the Lord, we say. It's not praise the Lord, it's praise Yahweh. Get his name right. And everything else starts to turn around because we, he, you know, there's a power in the name. There's power in words. There's power in the name, and um, it's more important, I think, than a lot of people realize. So John the Baptist's message again was repent. And uh, if you read with me in Luke one, Luke one verses fourteen to seventeen, talking about the, bap- the birth of John the Baptizer, John the Immerser. Luke 1, verses 14 to 17, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of Yahweh, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to Yahweh their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for Yahweh. Now, brethren, please understand that in Malachi 4 it says that he was going to restore the law of Moses. Sin is is the transgression of the law. And so this John the Baptist was, was to turn the hearts of the people and make them be obedient and to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make them understand the law of God was what they needed to be following. And this Elijah to come is going to focus on relationships. He's going to, not just on intellectual doctrine. He's going to focus on relationships with Yahweh first, and then with our families, and with one body, with the one body of Christ, until we have one total unity that comes with that. Harmony between men and women in the church, and a mutual respect that's profound that men have for women, and women have for men. That's profound that adults have for their children and children have for adults. We're all made in the image of God. And harmony between husbands and wives, harmony between fathers and children. All the while there will be a terrible attempt from Satan to destroy the family, and we, the people of God, are going to fight that and attack the gates of hell with the wisdom of God and by His relationships and by His love and by his everything that he does to bring us together as one. We must come together. We must work on our work on our marriages. We must work on our relationships with our kids and grandkids and grandparents and, and everyone else in relationship. We must pray for people all around the world to come back to Yahweh. And we know that this prayer will be good for you and that thousands will come back to Yahweh in the last day. We know that that's going to happen. So what's your next step? <clears throat> Last time I mentioned the prayers of Paul, Peter, Nehemiah, and so many others. Now turn to Joel too. Remember Joel? He said basically, I don't care even if you've just gotten married. Joel too. Leave your wedding room, your wedding chamber. Get out of here with the rest of us. Fast and pray. Repent for yourselves. For your country. This is more important than consummating a marriage. That's what Joel 2 says. Joel 2, verses 15 to 19. I'd like to hear some of I'd like to hear from some of you. Let's declare fast for our own repentance before Passover 2012 and for the state of the Ecclesia of God, the called out ones, and then for our nation. What day would work best for most of you? I'm thinking sometime in late March, early April middle of March, something like that. Joel 2, verses 15 to 19. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. 
Gather the children, even the nursing babies. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. <coughs> he then tells the priests, the ministers, to start having more intercessory prayer, to lead by example with that. Joel 2, verse 17. Let the priests who minister to Yahweh weep before the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, or Yahweh, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And then Yahweh will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Then Yahweh will be zealous for his land. Yahweh will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make your reproach among the nations. Spiritually, could verse 19 be meaning spiritual food, a new dosage of the Holy Spirit? Ministers of Yahweh, pastors of congregations, start preaching this. Joel 2.17 commands you to. Ministers of Creator God, weep before Him, it says, and beg Him to spare His people. That's what it says. Weep before Him. You get a minister who weeps before the people and they think he's losing it. They think he's losing control. He's, he's emotional. He's this way, he's that way. Well, God Almighty says, weep. Let them weep before, between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Yahweh. Brethren, remember, I've been saying how we must pray the nations repent. I want to remind you that it's got to start with us. We have to start with repenting for our own condition. It reminded me of what they say on the air, air flights. You get on an airplane, they say if the oxygen mask comes down, put your own mask on first and then help your child. We can't be much help to anyone else if we continue in sin ourselves. We're told to come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Uh, Father's being pretty graphic here to us. He's telling us, you know, you guys are fornicating with the world. Uh, you're involved in her sins. You like the stuff that you know are wrong. I preach to myself as much as to any of you on that. Terrible sins we have to repent of. Bible, God, God himself says very plainly, very plain language, come out of that whore. Do you understand what he's saying here? Come out of her, my people. Do you understand what he's saying here, brethren? Don't be offended at my graphicness. Take it up with Father. He's speaking to his kids. The Bible is actually pretty incredibly graphic in places, isn't it? Number one, we start with our own sinful condition. Then number two, we pray for the body of Christ, the church. We're in such sad shape right now. We're splintering. We're hardly the one body Scripture speak of. When our bridegroom says he feels like throwing up when he thinks of some of those in the end time who will not who will be part of the bride, something's terribly, terribly wrong. When a bridegroom wants to throw up when he thinks of his bride, something's terribly wrong. First Peter four seventeen says judgment begins with the house of God. That's you, brethren. That's you, and that's me. That's the church. First Timothy three fifteen, the that the house of God is the church. The house of Yahweh was the temple, which we are today. We are the temple of God's Holy Spirit, housing the very presence of the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of Yahweh himself. So we're being judged right now. When was the last time you realized that you're in court before the judge? Right now? A lot to repent of, isn't there? Remember I read Ezekiel 9 last time when Yahweh tells the, arch, tells the angel to mark those who are sighing and crying and to begin at the sanctuary and those who are worshiping there. Are you listening, brethren? Who's the sanctuary? Who are the worshipers? That's us, the body of Christ, the body of believers. We're a mess right now. We're divided. We're splintered. We're not at all zealous. God have mercy on us. God have mercy on us. So you see what I'm saying, okay? So the God, the real God of heaven and earth is God Almighty. 
He's, he loved the world so much he died for it. He's sending an Elijah the prophet who's going to teach and preach repentance. All of these are, are, the reason I'm talking about all these things is to help us understand that we are going to have a message of repentance. And I hope that you're praying for it. And I hope you're doing it. In Amos chapter 5 and 7, you're going to hear and read more examples. I'm almost out of time. I've got a lot yet to cover, so I've got to, I've got to speed this up a little bit. I had another friend write me, a friend from Light on the Rock, and he says in Amos 5, Amos 5, verse 6, and verses 14 to 15. Amos 5, verse 6. I want to conclude here by reading a few more scriptures about Yahweh's desire to change even the course of his own very prophet prophecies if we would just repent. So my friend was saying in Amos 5, I was just reading it, he said, Amos 5, verse 6, Seek, seek Yahweh and you shall live lest he break out like a fire on the house of Joseph and devour it, and there be none to seek him that you shall live, lest he break out. You see what he's saying? Verse 14, seek good and not evil that you may live. And the end of verse 15, it may be that Yahweh, God of hosts, will be gracious. So believe it. Amos did. Amos got it. It's all the way through the Bible like that. We don't need to understand exactly how it all works out. We just have to know who we're dealing with, who. If you know who we're dealing with, the how will take care of itself. He takes no delight in the, in the, in the, in the death of the wicked. I want to read to you Amos 7 now. I was reading this the other night. After my friend was talking about Amos 5, I thought, well, let me get into Amos 2. But Amos 7, verses 1 to 3. Thus Adonai Yahweh, Lord God, it says in English, it's... Adonai Yahweh, showed me, behold, he formed locust swarms. A great big locust plague was coming. And so it was, verse 2, when they had finished eating the grass of the land. And Micah's watching this in vision or in action or whatever was going on. But Micah starts to, starts to pray. Adonai, my master, Yahweh, forgive, I pray. Oh, that Jacob may stand. He is small. Amos is interceding. And so Yahweh relented concerning this. It shall not be, said Yahweh. Are you letting that sink in? The Hebrew word in verse 3 for relented is the same as repented in some translations. He turned around from the direction God did, from the direction he was headed in, because a man, wasn't Micah the, the shepherd, uh, or sycamore, you know, sycamore picker and a shepherd, the word was a, has a hint to the word says relented of sighing, consoling, feeling pity. One man, Amos. Wait a minute. I'm reading Amos or Micah here. Hang on a minute. Talk about Amos and Micah. Yeah, Amos. If I've been saying Micah, I meant uh, I meant to be saying Amos here. One man, Amos, prayed and looked, and look what happened. If a thousand or two thousand of the kingdom of God folks would pray this kind of prayer. I'm convinced we'll see dramatic things happening. I'm convinced of it. Don't let naysayers stop you. What if Amos had been like so many of us and said, it doesn't matter, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Turn now to Amos 7, verses 4 to 6. And then Adonai Yahweh showed me again. He says, he called for conflict by fire and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. And I said, oh, Adonai Yahweh, Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, cease, I pray. Stop it. Please stop it, God. Oh, that Jacob may stand. He is small. And so Yahweh relented concerning this. This also shall not be so, said Adonai Yahweh, Master Yahweh. Now, it's true. If you read the rest of the book of Amos, a whole host of punishments are pronounced on Israel. But even there, by the time you get to the ending verses of Amos 9, there are some very inspiring changes of heart in Israel that are prophesied. Hosea uh, talks about God saying, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? This is God's heart. This is God's heart. Turn with me to Jeremiah 26, verses 2 and 3. Jeremiah 26, verses 2 and 3. I could go on all day with the words of what he would prefer to do, and that's to have mercy. In this next verse, look who's addressed. It's those who are the church. It's the church. It's the called out ones. It's the ecclesia, the Israel of God, the spiritual Jews. Jeremiah 26, verses 2 and 3. Thus says Yahweh, Stand in the court of Yahweh's house 
and speak to all the cities of Judah which come to worship in Yahweh's house, who is worshiping in the house of God. That's us, brethren. I hope it's us. And speak to them all the words that I command you to speak to them. Do not diminish a single word. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way. I'm reading Jeremiah 26, verse 3. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way, that I may relent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evil of their doing. Jeremiah here is being told to tell them God can relent. Brethren, God isn't kidding. Yahweh isn't kidding. He isn't bluffing. He isn't blowing smoke. He means everything he says. Spread the word. Pray the word. Pray for mercy. Pray our Father leads millions of people to repentance. Join me in falling down before our Maker. Let's give ourselves to him fully. Let's stop the infighting. Let's stop the splintering, the gossiping. Let's insist on visiting all your brethren, br- brothers and sisters, regardless of what uh, organization they're in. Right now, I think of God's church. They're like a big mansion full of many rooms, and all of one organization are in one room, and the other rooms for another organization. Well, visit all your children. Let's pray for forgiveness of ourselves, and our, our, our church, our nation. Let's pray for his mercy. In fact, I've got a couple minutes left here. Let's just do it right now. Let's do it right now. O Yahweh, before whom the mighty angels and the elders in heaven prostrate themselves, before whom entire mountain ranges crumble and oceans roar at your word, our great and awesome and merciful Abba, we claim your power, we claim your promises, we claim your mercy, we claim your heart. We claim all this because of who and what you are. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are and and, and you are what you will be and, and who you were. You're the amazingly merciful Abba, our dear Father. And before anything else, I beg, have mercy on me, Father. Forgive me my sins. And forgive each of us who are hearing this. And forgive those, and may those that we have hurt, may they be able to forgive us also for their own healing and for their own sakes also. Then, Father, have mercy on us who are the body of Messiah. Bring us to holy echad, meaning oneness, to being truly one, truly unified in you and in your righteousness. Yeshua told us the secret to being one in his prayer in John 17. He said, we must be in you. And if Christ, if we're in Christ, we can become one again with each other. And one body, parts of each other, supporting and helping and coming together as a working body. We have so much work to do, Father. And we have allowed the Satan to tear us apart and get us tearing and working against each other. Forgive us, Father, for that. Forgive us. In Christ, O oh Father, see us veiled, covered by your Holy Son, Yeshua. Please, O oh Yahweh, delight in us once again. As we no longer want to live to the flesh, but to your Spirit. Make us holy. Make us kadosh. Set apart for your holy use. Open the doors for us to make disciples of all nations. Give us the courage to attack the gates of hell itself. Help us see the the paths you have set out for us and to walk in them with faith and confidence and to have the desire and the power in your love and by what your Holy Spirit is showing us. See your own Holy Son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach in us and over us. And because of what and who he is, let us hear your words in our hearts. Please, Abba, Please let us hear you say, as you first give us, these are my delightful children in whom I'm well pleased, as you see him living in us. Then, Father, help us remember that you've called us to do a job you've given us to do. You've called us to represent you here on this earth. You made us a part of your family, and you have, and you want us to speak of your love and who you are, and then to demonstrate your love. 
and the life changed by your spirit. Burn away the chaff in our life as you meet us on your threshing floor. You wanted us to be lights of your way of life, evidenced by your own changed life and the profound love we have for each other. But Abba, we failed to represent you fully. We desperately have failed. And we failed to demonstrate your profound love. So we beg you for another chance as your children to do the job you've given us to do, to proclaim who you are, the amazing God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Please, dear Father in heaven, God of Abraham, have mercy on your people, Israel, on the remnants of Israel, and even on the people of all the world. We are but flesh, Father. We're but flesh. Bring us to repentance as a nation. We love our countrymen, countrymen, Father. You yourself said you love the world that you, so much that you sent Yeshua to die, your very own son, to die for us here on earth. You sacrificed your own son in order to covenant with us. We broke our solemn oath of covenant with you, and for that we pray that you bring people to repentance and forgive them and forgive us. Have mercy on your land, Father. You so loved the world, and, and, and then you put that love for all your people into our hearts, and we pray back your own words to you, Father. O oh, beloved Yahweh, our Abba, our God, Please love America. Please love Britain and Canada and Australia, the Netherlands and the scattered descendants of people in Israel, wherever they are, no matter if what any human being made in your likeness, whatever their race or nationality, love them, Father, love them, and love them, Abba. Don't give up on them. Our nations have done evil and turned their backs on you. You have every right to be angry, but love them, Father. Send the world an Elijah who will turn their hearts back to you. Open our eyes to see who that is when the time comes and to support him when we, when you reveal him. Have mercy on our cities. Have mercy on us, dear God. Have mercy on our leaders. Savior, remember your own words on Calvary when you pleaded with Father so astonishingly. After what we all, all humankind had done to you, you said those amazingly powerful words of love. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeshua, you're amazing. Yeshua, our thoughts are not your thoughts. So we ask for a miracle. Come inside of us. Give us your thoughts. Make us think like you think. Let your mind be our mind. And let your mind come into us and let us love the world the way you love them. We lift our hands to you and we pray back to you your own words. Have mercy on them. Have mercy. They know not what they do. We've all fallen short of your glory. Have mercy on them, O Father. Have mercy on us who deserve no mercy. We can only claim all this because of who you say you are. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Yeshua. Bring us to repentance, all of us. Brethren, let's leave it with that. Go pray. Go pray your heart out for your own repentance. Go pray right now for God's church, for your family, for your nation. In Yeshua's merciful name, this has been Philip Shields, your brother and co-heir of all the promises. But if the Lord, follow him. And then in 1 Corinthians 18, 21, So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together in Mount Carmel. How long will you falter between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Abaal, if the Lord is, then follow him. The people answered him not a word. And then when it came time for him to pray, in verse 36 to 37, at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah, uh, the prophet, came near and said, Yahweh. That was his name, you see. Yahweh is his name. Elohim is what he is. El Shaddai and those things are titles. His name is Yahweh. And I made that very clear, very plain in the two sermons I gave on that. Anyway, um, Yahweh, uh, Elijah the prophet, Eliah, came near. Eliah means my God is Yahweh, remember? Eliyahu. The prophet came near and said, Yahweh, Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Abram, Yitzhak, and Israel, Okay. Let it be known this day that you are Elohim. You are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that you are Yahweh Elohim, 
and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. You turned their hearts back to you again. What was the Elijah to do? He was to turn the hearts back to the fathers. And the father's heart back to, to them. And I'm sure that Elijah was praying to him, please have mercy. Turn your heart back to your people. And as father did that, he in turn turned the people's heart back to him. That's the first father that has to be determined here. And then once he's in place, then we turn our hearts back to the fathers that came before us. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice he says, Father, he says, Yahweh Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Those are also the fathers that we turn our hearts back to. And then also in a more localized way, right here in our very families, we turn our hearts back to one another. The families have been hit hard by Hasatan, by the Satan, by the adversary. Notice the turning of the hearts is back to the fathers, back to Yahweh himself first. He started by getting Israel to quit worshiping Habaal, the Lord, and start worshiping him by his true name, Yahweh. He is the father we start with, and his name is Yahweh. His name is Yahweh. 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 That's his name. Yahweh. Short firm is Yah. We say Hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise. Yah. Praise the Lord, we say. It's not praise the Lord, it's praise Yahweh. Get his name right, and everything else starts to turn around because we he you know there's a power in the name. There's power in words, there's power in the name. And um, it's more important, I think, than a lot of people realize. So John the Baptist's message, again, was repent. And uh, if you read with me in Luke 1, Luke 1, verses 14 to 17. Talking about the the birth of John the Baptizer, John the Immerser. Luke 1, verses 14 to 17. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of Yahweh, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, He shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to Yahweh their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for Yahweh. Now, brethren, please understand that in Malachi 4 it says that he was going to restore the law of Moses. Sin is the, is the transgression of the law. And so this John the Baptist was, was to turn the hearts of the people and make them be obedient and to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make them understand the law of God was what they needed to be following. And this Elijah to come is going to focus on relationships. He's going to not just on intellectual doctrine. He's going to focus on relationships with Yahweh first and then with our families and with one body, with the one body of Christ until we have one total unity that comes with that. Harmony between men and women in the church and a mutual respect that's profound that men have for women and women have for men. That's profound that adults have for their children and children have for adults. We're all made in the image of God. And harmony between husbands and wives. Harmony between fathers and children. All the while there will be a terrible attempt from Satan to destroy the family. And we, the people of God, are going to fight that and attack the gates of hell with the wisdom of God and by his relationships and by his love and by His everything that he does to bring us together as one. We must come together. We must work on our, work on our marriages We must work on our relationships with our kids and grandkids and grandparents and and everyone else in relationship. We must pray for people all around the world to come back to Yahweh. And we know that this prayer will be good for you and that thousands will come back to Yahweh in the last day. We know that that's going to happen. So what's your next step? Last time I mentioned the prayers of Paul, Peter, Nehemiah, and so many others. 
Now turn to Joel 2. Remember Joel? He said basically, I don't care even if you've just gotten married. Joel 2. Leave your wedding room, your wedding chamber. Get out of here with the rest of us. Fast and pray. Repent for yourselves, for your country. This is more important than consummating a marriage. That's what Joel 2 says. Joel 2, verses 15 to 19. I'd like to hear some of, I'd like to hear from some of you. Let's declare fast for our own repentance before Passover 2012 and for the state of the Ecclesia of God, the called out ones, and then for our nation. What day would work best for most of you? I'm thinking sometime in late March, early April. Middle of March, something like that. Joel 2, verses 15 to 19. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even the nursing babies. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. (coughs) He then tells the priests, the ministers, to start having more intercessory prayer and to lead by example with that. Joel 2, verse 17. Let the priest who minister to Yahweh weep before the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, or Yahweh, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And then Yahweh will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Then Yahweh will be zealous for his land. Yahweh will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Spiritually, could verse 19 be meaning spiritual food, a new dosage of the Holy Spirit? Ministers of Yahweh, pastors of congregations, start preaching this. Joel 2.17 commands you to. Ministers of Creator God, weep before Him, it says, and beg Him to spare His people. That's what it says. Weep before Him. You get a minister who weeps before the people and they think he's losing it. They think he's losing control. He's he's emotional. He's this way, he's that way. Well, God Almighty says, weep. Let them weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Yahweh. Brethren, remember, I've been saying how we must pray the nations repent. I want to remind you that it's got to start with us. We have to start with repenting for our own condition. It reminded me of what they say on the air, pl- air flights. You get on an airplane, they say if the oxygen mask comes down, put your own mask on first and then help your child. We can't be much help to anyone else if we continue in sin ourselves. We're told to come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Uh, Father's being pretty graphic here to us. He's telling us, you know, you guys are fornicating with the world. Uh, you're involved in her sins. You like the stuff that you know are wrong. I preach to myself as much as to any of you on that. Terrible sins we have to repent of. Bible, God, God himself says very plainly, very plain language, come out of that whore. Do you understand what he's saying here? Come out of her, my people. Do you understand what he's saying here, brethren? Don't be offended at my graphicness. Take it up with Father. He's speaking to his kids. The Bible is actually pretty incredibly graphic in places, isn't it? Number one, we start with our own sinful condition. Then number two, we pray for the body of Christ, the church. We're in such sad shape right now. We're splintering. We're hardly the one body Scripture speak of. When our bridegroom says he feels like throwing up when he thinks of some of those in the end time who will not who will be part of the bride, something's terribly, terribly wrong. When a bridegroom wants to throw up when he thinks of his bride, something's terribly wrong. First Peter four seventeen says judgment begins with the house of God. That's you, brethren. That's you. That's me. That's the church. First Timothy three fifteen the that the house of God is the church. The house of Yahweh was the temple, which we are today. We are the temple of God's Holy Spirit. 
housing the very presence of the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of Yahweh Himself. So we're being judged right now. When was the last time you realized that you're in court before the judge? Right now? A lot to repent of, isn't there? Remember I read Ezekiel 9 last time when Yahweh tells the, arch- tells the angel to mark those who are sighing and crying and to begin at the sanctuary and those who are worshiping there. Are you listening, brethren? Who's the sanctuary? Who are the worshipers? That's us, the body of Christ, the body of believers. We're a mess right now. We're divided. We're splintered. We're not at all zealous. God have mercy on us. God have mercy on us. So you see what I'm saying, okay? So the God, the real God of heaven and earth is God Almighty. He's, he loved the world so much he died for it. He's sending an Elijah the prophet who's going to teach and preach repentance. All of these are, are the reason I'm talking about all these things is to help us understand that we are going to have a message of repentance. And I hope that you're praying for it. And I hope you're doing it. In Amos chapter 5 and 7, you're going to hear and read more examples. I'm almost out of time. I've got a lot yet to cover, so I've got to, I've got to speed this up a little bit. I had another friend write me, a friend from Light on the Rock, and he says in Amos 5, Amos 5, verse 6, and verses 14 to 15. Amos 5, verse 6. I want to conclude here by reading a few more scriptures about Yahweh's desire to change even the course of his own very prophet prophecies, if we would just repent. So my friend was saying in Amos 5, I was just reading it, he said, Amos 5, verse 6, Seek, seek Yahweh and you shall live lest he break out like a fire on the house of Joseph and devour it, and there be none to seek him that you shall live, lest he break out. You see what he's saying? Verse 14, seek good and not evil that you may live. And the end of verse 15, it may be that Yahweh, God of hosts, will be gracious. So believe it. Amos did. Amos got it. It's all the way through the Bible like that. We don't need to understand exactly how it all works out. We just have to know who we're dealing with. Who? If you know who we're dealing with, the how will take care of itself. He takes no delight in the, in the, in the, in the death of the wicked. I want to read to you Amos 7 now. I was reading this the other night. After my friend was talking about Amos 5, I thought, well, let me get into Amos 2. But Amos 7, verses 1 to 3. Thus Adonai Yahweh, Lord God, it says in English, it's... Adonai Yahweh, showed me, behold, he formed locust swarms. A great big locust plague was coming. And so it was, verse 2, when they had finished eating the grass of the land. And Micah's watching this in vision or in act or whatever was going on. But Micah starts to, starts to pray. Adonai, my master, Yahweh, forgive, I pray. Oh, that Jacob may stand. He is small. Amos is interceding. And so Yahweh relented concerning this. It shall not be, said Yahweh. Are you letting that sink in? The Hebrew word in verse 3 for relented is the same as repented in some translations. He turned around from the direction God did, from the direction he was headed in, because a man, wasn't Micah the the shepherd, uh, or sycamore, sycamore picker and a shepherd, the word was a, has a hint to the word says relented of sighing, consoling, feeling pity. One man, Amos. Wait a minute. I'm reading Amos or Micah here. Hang on a minute. Talk about Amos and Micah. Yeah, Amos. If I've been saying Micah, I meant uh, I meant to be saying Amos here. One man, Amos, prayed and looked, and look what happened. If a thousand or two thousand of the kingdom of God folks would pray this kind of prayer. I'm convinced we'll see dramatic things happening. I'm convinced of it. Don't let naysayers stop you. What if Amos had been like so many of us and said, it doesn't matter, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Turn now to Amos 7, verses 4 to 6. And then Adonai Yahweh showed me again. He says, he called for conflict by fire and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. And I said, oh, Adonai Yahweh, Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, cease, I pray. Stop it. Please stop it, God. Oh, that Jacob may stand. He is small. And so Yahweh relented concerning this. 
This also shall not be so, said Adonai Yahweh, Master Yahweh. Now it's true, if you read the rest of the book of Amos, a whole host of punishments are pronounced on Israel. But even there, by the time you get to the ending verses of Amos 9, there are some very inspiring changes of heart in Israel that are prophesied. Hosea uh, talks about God saying, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? This is God's heart. This is God's heart. Turn with me to Jeremiah 26, verses 2 and 3. Jeremiah 26, verses 2 and 3. I could go on all day with the words of what he would prefer to do, and that's to have mercy. In this next verse, look who's addressed. It's those who are the church. It's the church. It's the called out ones, the ecclesia, the Israel of God, the spiritual Jews. Jeremiah 26, verses 2 and 3. Thus says Yahweh, Stand in the court of Yahweh's house and speak to all the cities of Judah which come to worship in Yahweh's house. Who is worshiping in the house of God? That's us, brethren. I hope it's us. And speak to them all the words that I command you to speak to them. Do not diminish a single word. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way. I'm reading Jeremiah 26, verse 3. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way, that I may relent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evil of their doing. Jeremiah here is being told to tell them God can relent. Brethren, God isn't kidding. Yahweh isn't kidding. He isn't bluffing. He isn't blowing smoke. He means everything he says. Spread the word. Pray the word. Pray for mercy. Pray our Father leads millions of people to repentance. Join me in falling down before our Maker. Let's give ourselves to him fully. Let's stop the infighting. Let's stop the splintering, the gossiping. Let's insist on visiting all your brethren, br brothers and sisters, regardless of what uh, organization they're in. Right now, I think of God's church. They're like a big mansion full of many rooms, and all of one organization are in one room, and the other rooms for another organization. Well, visit all your children. Let's pray for forgiveness of ourselves, and our, our, our church our nation. Let's pray for his mercy. In fact, I've got a couple minutes left here. Let's just do it right now. Let's do it right now. O Yahweh, before whom the mighty angels and the elders in heaven prostrate themselves, before whom entire mountain ranges crumble and oceans roar at your word, our great and awesome and merciful Abba, we claim your power, we claim your promises, we claim your mercy. We claim your heart. We claim all this because of who and what you are. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are and, and, and you are what you will be and, and who you were. You're the amazingly merciful Abba, our dear Father. And before anything else, I beg, have mercy on me, Father. Forgive me my sins. And forgive each of us who are hearing this. And forgive those, and may those that we have hurt, may they be able to forgive us also for their own healing and for their own sakes also. Then, Father, have mercy on us who are the body of Messiah. Bring us to holy echad, meaning oneness, to being truly one, truly unified in you and in your righteousness. Yeshua told us the secret to being one in his prayer in John 17. He said, we must be in you. And if Christ, if we're in Christ, we can become one again with each other. And one body, parts of each other, supporting and helping and coming together as a working body. We have so much work to do, Father. And we have allowed the Satan to tear us apart and get us tearing and working against each other. Forgive us, Father, for that. Forgive us. In Christ, O oh Father, see us veiled, covered by your Holy Son, Yeshua. Please, O oh Yahweh, delight in us once again. As we no longer want to live to the flesh, but to your Spirit. Make us holy. Make us kadosh. 
set apart for your holy use. Open the doors for us to make disciples of all nations. Give us the courage to attack the gates of hell itself. Help us see the the path you have set out for us and to walk in them with faith and confidence and to have the desire and the power in your love and by what your Holy Spirit is showing us. See your own Holy Son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach in us and over us. And because of what and who he is, let us hear your words in our hearts. Please, Abba, please let us hear you say as you first give us These are my delightful children in whom I'm well pleased as you see him living in us. Then, Father, help us remember that you've called us to do a job you've given us to do. You've called us to represent you here on this earth. You made us a part of your family and you you want us to speak of your love and who you are and then to demonstrate your love. And the life changed by your spirit. Burn away the chaff in our life as you meet us on your threshing floor. You wanted us to be lights of your way of life, evidenced by your own changed life and the profound love we have for each other. But Abba, we failed to represent you fully. We desperately have failed. And we failed to demonstrate your profound love. So we beg you for another chance as your children to do the job you've given us to do, to proclaim who you are, the amazing God, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Please, dear Father in heaven, God of Abraham, have mercy on your people, Israel, on the remnants of Israel, and even on the people of all the world. We are but flesh, Father. We're but flesh. Bring us to repentance as a nation. We love our countrymen, countrymen, Father. You yourself said you love the world that you, so much that you sent Yeshua to die, your very own son, to die for us here on earth. You sacrificed your own son in order to covenant with us. We broke our solemn oath of covenant with you, and for that we pray that you bring people to repentance and forgive them and forgive us. Have mercy on your land, Father. You so loved the world, and and, and then you put that love for all your people into our hearts, and we pray back your own words to you, Father. O beloved Yahweh, our Abba, our God, Please love America. Please love Britain and Canada and Australia, the Netherlands and the scattered descendants of people in Israel, wherever they are, no matter if what any human being made in your likeness, whatever their race or nationality, love them, Father, love them, and love them, Abba. Don't give up on them. Our nations have done evil and turned their backs on you. You have every right to be angry, but love them, Father. Send the world an Elijah who will turn their hearts back to you. Open our eyes to see who that is when the time comes and to support him when we, when you reveal him. Have mercy on our cities. Have mercy on us, dear God. Have mercy on our leaders. Savior, remember your own words on Calvary when you pleaded with Father so astonishingly after what we all, all humankind had done to you. You said those amazingly powerful words of love. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeshua, you're amazing. Yeshua, our thoughts are not your thoughts. So we ask for a miracle. Come inside of us. Give us your thoughts. Make us think like you think. Let your mind be our mind. And let your mind come into us and let us love the world the way you love them. We lift our hands to you and we pray back to you your own words. Have mercy on them. Have mercy. They know not what they do. We've all fallen short of your glory. Have mercy on them, O Father. Have mercy on us who deserve no mercy. We can only claim all this because of who you say you are. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Yeshua. Bring us to repentance, all of us. Brethren, let's leave it with that. Go pray. Go pray your heart out for your own repentance. Go pray right now for God's church, for your family, for your nation. In Yeshua's merciful name, this has been Philip Shields, your brother and co-heir of all the promises.